Hello, world changers, and welcome. We hope you are doing great and you are just excited as we are and as I am to welcome Martin this evening. If you are part of the Brand Minds community, you probably had the chance to meet Martin via one of the Brand Minds events organized in the past. Yet, if you didn't and you are here for the first time, let me tell you a bit about Martin's incredible work and expertise. Martin Lindstrom is one of the world's most respected consumer branding experts and the pioneer in the fields of consumer psychology, marketing, and neuromarketing research. He has, for more than a decade, advised Fortune Top 500 brands such as Lego, Cartoon Network, American Express, HSBC, or Microsoft, and he's the best-selling author of seven books. Furthermore, he has co-founded BBDO Interactive from Fab, Europe's largest brand dialogue company. This evening, Martin will be talking about his latest book on organizational culture, The Ministry of Common Sense, How to Eliminate Bureaucratic Red Tape, Bad Excuses, and Corporate Bullshit. The book debuted straight to number two on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list following its launch in January of this year, and it talks about how highly companies can be affected by things such as bureaucracy, perpetual change fatigue, and the lack of honesty. The good news is that the book is already available on perturesh.ro, so you can order it right now. I will let Martin tell you more about it in just a few moments, but before we welcome him, I would like to take a minute to highlight an important message for those interested in learning more about business strategy in these challenging times. As you probably already know, this spring, on the 23rd of March, Brand Minds is bringing Costas Marquides, innovation professor at London Business School, in a full day of business strategy masterclass for top executives' events supported by Unicredit Bank. Since you are here today with us, Brand Minds team has activated a 10% discount for the masterclass under code STRATEGY10. The code expires in less than 48 hours, so make sure to use it on www.brandminds.live as long as it is available. So, now let's get back, get back to our live meet, meeting and give a warm welcome to our dear brand expert, Martin Lindstrom. Martin, hello, do you hear us? Good to see you. Good to see you again. I think we've last saw each other in physical life in 2014. I really miss those you kind of events. It's almost like the screen was freezing in the meantime, and there you are. <laughs> exactly. So thank you very much for taking time to talk to us tonight. It's a pleasure to meet you again to talk about this amazing book that uh, has, you know, everyone is talking about it. I have it here. I told you that I've read this like I did during my student time with uh, the pen and paper and actually took a lot of notes. It's been fun. Uh, and then it made me a little bit sad. Uh, it made me laugh again. Uh, but it's so true and there are so many cliches there that we are used to in the corporate life. So uh, I will let you talk more about this. So please. Tell us, how did you came with this idea of this book and uh, if it was uh, that difficult to write it? Well, it was incredible fun to write, but it took me 10 years. And it took me 10 years because I had to spend the time on observing companies and understand why is it so horrible to work in a company today? Where did it go wrong? And just to illustrate my point, let me start off with a little commercial. It's only two and a half minutes long, but it can give you a sense of the reality we're living in right now. Take a look at this. Hello? Hello. Excuse me. What time are we starting? Is this thing on? I can't hear you. Did anyone get an agenda or is it just me? I hope you don't mind that Helen's here. She gets really weird when I close the door on her. Just like that. Oh, dude, no. Oh, somebody tell him. Oh, I thought I turned the camera off. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear you. You're muted. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so you go. You go first. Okay. So I was thinking. So you saw. Uh, oh, so no, 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 please. Okay. I'm um, ready for my PowerPoint presentation. <sighs> oh, I've cut it down. It'll only. It's only 186 slides. TikTok. TikTok. I have to go be so bad. It'll only take 90 minutes. Where the 
Pecker, Sandy, Bob one and two. How come they're always the last to join? I, I can't wait anymore. <laughs> I'll be right back. Well, that was two hours of my life. I'll never get back. Next meeting, let's make it two days from now, same time. And let's get some decisions made. Hey guys, how's it going? Oh, wait. What, what company is this? Hi, oh, so Gosh, this is the reality we're living right now. So Hello. You can recognize it, right? Oh, my. So what is going on? Well, I'm not sure you like me, but certainly what I'm experiencing is I'm sitting in front of Zoom or Microsoft Team for, I don't know, eight hours or 10 hours a day, back to back. There's no toilet breaks. I'm not sure where toilet breaks went. They just completely disappeared. And by the way, once you are finished at eight o'clock in the night, you throw yourself at the couch, exhausted. And this is the moment where it's time to do your work. Can you recognize it? This is the life we live right now. So here's my question to all of you guys. I want you to help me here for a second. I'm going to ask you a question. So we'll put a questionnaire on the screen right now. And I'd like you to fill out this one just to help me to see how you feel like. So here's the question. The question is, how often are you just checking your other emails? Spending a little bit of time checking social channels and it while on a one-hour conference call. And I want you to be honest now. Are you 100% focused on that call? Or are you just checking things and doing things in the meantime? And by the way, you have three different answers. Okay, I do it fairly often. I'm admitting it. Number two is occasionally. And of course, if you're a saint, it's 1.3. It is actually, I never do this. Can you just fill it in right now on the screen and tell me what the number is? I'm really curious to hear about it. And while you do that, let me just say a few words on it. Because here is the reality. I don't believe that there is anything going back to work. I call it going forward to work. And with that, I mean that COVID-19 has fundamentally changed our world. And with that means that we should not adopt the way we worked in the good old days. We should change the entire way we're working. We should look at it from another lens. And that's exactly what I did. So a little bit later on today, I'm going to take you through some of the learnings I've been through in reshuffling my own private life. But before I tell you more about that, I just want to hear, is there any answers coming up on the screen right now? Actually, do you hear me, Martin? We have number two, number two, occasionally. I can add number two for me in my case as well. <laughs> number two, again, depending on the quality of the conversation. So, as you can see, number two for me also. So, I think we have a winner. The number two is the winner. A winner. And that means that I know for a fact that you, while you're watching me right now, you're going to do some other work and I can't even stop you. So, I'd better be entertaining. I'll do my best, okay? I promise you. So, before doing that, I want to tell you a story. Um, in fact, uh, some years ago, I was in the Miami and I was um, at this hotel. I wanted to watch television. So what did I do? I grabbed the remote control. And in fact, I have, still have this remote control. Here's the remote control. And it has three numerical keyboards. It has uh, six arrows going up and down. It has A, B, C, D, E, F. I have no idea about what it's used for. And it doesn't even have one, but it has two on buttons. I'm not sure how that works if you press the first one and it's on. And then you press the second on button and, and the television's extra or supernatural on. Not sure about that one. Anyway, I managed to switch on the television. And guess what? Then I want to watch some television. Or rather, I try to watch some television. Because what happens is that it has also an off button. And I want to switch off the television. And it's nearly impossible do you know why? Because this remote control, in fact, has not one, but has two off buttons. When I press the first off button, the light in the room is dimming in kind of a moody, sexy way. And when I press the second one, the air conditioning system goes off. But of course, the television is still on, right? 
So I go into panic. I crawl under the bed. I unplug the whole thing, including the mini bar and the lamp. And yes, the television switches off. And this is really my story about what's going on because here's the issue. I'm kind of blaming myself here. I kind of feel how stupid I am that, that this is happening. So that's the reason why I decided to do something unusual. I decided to say, well, what is the reason why? And as I was trying to find out this is happening and this is crazy, I'm sitting on a plane on the way to JF Kennedy's airport. And on the plane, I sit next to this gentleman. He's an engineer. And guess what? He's the guy inventing that remote control. So I say to him, what the fuck went wrong with you guys when you developed it? And the guy is looking at me like a deer in the headlight. And he's saying, well, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, we had all these fights with the inventory, he called it, on the remote control. So you know, Netflix was fighting for some space. TiVo was fighting for some space. Uh, the recording function for some space. So we decided to split it into different zones. And, and literally, we had one zone responsible for TiVo, another one for Netflix, whatever. And suddenly, it all made sense. Suddenly, we had a perfect separation of this entire remote control. And of course, I had to ask the guy, well, why couldn't it be more simple? And the guy kind of looked at me and he sort of said, um, what do you mean? Because he had solved his problem internally. And I said to him, well, I can't still switch on the television. The issue was I was blaming myself. I thought I was stupid. But the reality is that companies today increasingly are in a situation where they actually are seeing the world from inside out rather than outside in. And that is really my concern. And that's the reason why what we decided to do was to look at how how are things changing? What What is the reason why all this stuff is happening? And I think one good way of doing it is to, first of all, define what common sense is, because that's common sense to create a simple remote control, right? Well, common sense is seeing things as they are and doing things as they ought to be done. Or said in another way, to treat consumers and customers and employees as they themselves would expect to be treated. And I'm sure you tried it. I mean, why has a simple action like buying office equipment turned into a six-people committee decision followed by a five-level approval process? As I say, when a 264-page PowerPoint deck kicks off with welcome to our spring party planning committee meeting, I personally believe it's time to call the Ministry of Sense and get an end to all this stuff here. So what is so fascinating about this is that what I discovered as I started to write the book was that there's actually a correlation between empathy and common sense. In fact, the less empathy you have, the less common sense you have. And empathy is really defined as the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within their frame of reference. That is the capacity to place oneself in another's position. And I think a good way of illustrating that is really to tell you about an experience I had on a ship. In fact, I was standing on the ship and there was this seasick person next to me. And he was throwing up. He had a horrible time. And I asked him, um, would you like to have a napkin? You know, you obviously feel really bad. I feel sorry for you. Well, that concept is actually called sympathy. But if I would have started to throw up next to this person, then that would have been empathy. And this is the essence. We actually increasingly are losing that sense of empathy, which is an issue. So here's what I would like to do. I'd like to share some videos with you just to give you a sense of why this is so profound to understand empathy. And by the way, this is probably going to be the word everyone would be talking about over the next five, if not 10 years. So mark my words now. What you're hearing right now is going to be what every businessman and woman would talk about over the next many, many years. But let me just share with you a fascinating experiment done by Teresa Weissman. The experiment was really conducted based on a very simple idea. They wanted to figure out what is the difference between empathy and sympathy and what impact does it have on, on us as human beings. So what happened with this experiment was that people were invited into this lab and they were asked to fill out a questionnaire about how happy they were. 
And once I did that, in fact, something happened. And what happened was a bit unusual because it seemed like it was a coincidence. But actually, everything you're going to see on the screen right now is part of the plan. Take a look. Hey, guys, is anyone parked out on the street with a white infinity? Me. You, you didn't park, like, at the meters, did you? Yeah. Okay. Do any of you guys have a black Toyota? Oh, please don't tell me it's a Toyota Yaris. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Seriously? Yeah. What happened? No. This is just on there. Oh, why did I get that? Did I just get a parking ticket? Shoot. That's weird. I just put money in the meter. I paid it for two hours at quarter of. I paid for the parking meter. Did you? And it said approved. Because the sign said like two hours at like 10 p.m. I was like, oh, I should be okay. Son of a god. It sucks. Oh, Did you get a parking ticket? Yeah. I thought that street was safe though, because today's Monday, right? It is Monday. So it said no, there's street sweeping on Tuesday, and then it said two hours between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. You sure it wasn't 10 a.m. and 6 p.m.? I should probably take a picture of it Jeez. and try to. It's like, dang. I don't know how I got a ticket. I'm not in the red. So remember, these people did not know that everything was a complete setup. And this is what happened. First, the guy overseeing this whole experiment would now approach 50% of the respondents and feel with them using sympathy, not empathy. And what was the reaction when they did that? Well, here's what happened. Did you get a parking ticket? Yeah. Wow, that sucks. I'm not exactly sure why. Good thing they caught it. Maybe he would have gotten towed if it had been there longer or something like that. That's true. Yeah. Sam, that looks good. Yeah, look on the bright okay. side. Could have been worse, I guess. Oh, man. You know? And it's not like you're going to get towed or anything. Do they do that around here? They're vicious. Yeah, at least you didn't get towed or something like that. Okay. Maybe you can find it. I hope so, because I'm kind of like, that's a little... Yeah. Okay, you get what I mean now. Now we're going to go to the second part of the experiment, and that's where the same... I always seeing the research went down to the other 50%, but this time he was using empathy. I was trying to put himself in the shoes of the respondents. And here's where you see a slight difference. Did you get a parking ticket? Yes, but I just paid for two hours. Ouch. They're the worst. They just blow your whole day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm stunned. It was $63. Oh, no. Tickets are so expensive. Maybe they made a mistake or something. That sucks, though. I don't know. Credit card didn't go through. Or Maybe, something. yeah, because yeah. like you just oh, walk yeah. away, right, after yeah. you do it. I said approved before we walked away. Oh, shoot! I swear, like my car was one time 13 inches from the curb, and they were like too much. It's ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> I've gotten parking tickets from the city, and like that were not there. I don't know, like everybody says that, but I swear. <laughs> you notice a difference? What's the difference, right? Because here's the issue. The issue is that this gentleman was much more engaged in the feelings. And I tell you, it showed at the results. Because here's what happened. After that happened, the research person would come in and say, hey, I'm so sorry this happened with the parking tickets. In fact, I think we need to redo the survey, asking you about your happiness levels, because obviously you've been infected by this. So people were filling out the survey one more time. Of course, what they didn't know still was that all of this was fake. And here's the results. Those people which were impacted by sympathy, in fact, their happiness level dropped some 10%, 10% using sympathy. But those people which are impacted by empathy, their levels of happiness, and listen to this, this is crazy, their level of happiness went up. 10%. That means 20 basic points difference between empathy and sympathy. And then, of course, you can ask yourself, why is that? And I think the best way to illustrate that was, of course, that now would reveal, by the way, all of this was a setup to measure your happiness level. And this is what they told the Reset Lab guy once they revealed how they felt as he was talking to them, either using sympathy or empathy. I felt like we were on the same team, like the same side. Like, oh, you know, this guy knows exactly what I'm talking about. Feeling like I'm not the only person that gets a ton of parking tickets made me feel better. And I was like, okay, you're good. Like this will, you know, blow over. If someone like really sits down and is like, oh my gosh, we'll figure this out. I'm on your team. Then you feel like, they're kind of going above and beyond being a decent human being. That sucks that you had to go through that. You know, that's like the typical 
like your average response. Like people really care, they're like, yeah, I've been there. You know, they'll take the time to relate your situation to help you feel better, to get you out of it. Wow, it gives you an idea about what's really going on. I mean, it's all about seeing the world through a customer's point of view. And I think sometimes we have a tendency to forget about that, whether that is how we set up and design a store, like this is the Home Depot store in the United States, which could not understand why no one was buying their products. Well, they were certainly not looking it through the eyes or the lens of the consumer. Or it is even our beloved Amazon, which everyone thinks is so fantastic. What I guess when you look at it through another point of view from outside in, you kind of have a slightly different story about what the reality is all about. And I guess my point of view is that we need to change uh, the the sideline of what's really going on. So if I bring back my little my little model here, if you take a look at, I just want to move one slide here. So this is really the point of view we need to look at the world from. We need to see it from two points of view. And the more we are able to see it from outside in, the more common sense we actually get. But there's some disturbing facts around this. In fact, what we now know is that according to the University of Michigan, uh, they conducted a study with 14,000 college students over 30 years. In fact, the recent study now is showing that they actually have seen their empathy level drop with 48% over the last decade alone. In fact, also the same study is showing that they, uh, college students' ability to share others' perspective fell with some 34%. What we now know is that these levels of empathy is falling dramatically. And you may say, well, who cares? Well, actually, it's very profound. Because what we're learning right now is sadly that the reason why we as a human species have become so powerful on this planet is because we had empathy levels ahead of any other mammals. In fact, if you go back in time, some 500,000 years ago, what was fascinating was that back then in time, they actually did not have uh, empathy because a, a part of our brain called the right supermarginal gyros is part of the cerebral cortex. In fact, was not developed, but it developed over time and gave us the ability to put ourselves in the footstep of a polar bear, whatever it may be, and kind of predict what that would be doing before it did. And, and that's the reason why we became such a powerful species. But now we're seeing that we're losing what actually made us become what we are. It may even explain why we saw the crisis in the United States the 6th of January, where suddenly democracy is starting to fall apart because we don't care. And why don't we care? Because of social media mainly. What we're seeing right now from all sorts of different studies is that the point of view has changed. I don't care about what other people are thinking because these self inflicting self-confirming small bubbles on social media are telling me only stuff I would like to hear. It's reinfirming my opinion about the world. And that basically means in the end of the day that what I end up with believing is that I'm always right. We also know, by the way, that the instant gratification generation is another really disturbing factor making all this happen. And by that, I mean, well, the fact is that if you only had to express yourself in 280 characters, well, how can you use emotions? How can you show a context? Now, well, what's happening is we're basically just seeing everything in black and white mood or yes or no. But the reality is we cannot express emotions. And then, of course, on top of that, we have the screen. How can you connect with people using empathy through the screen? So these are the, some of the things which are really disturbing and one of the reasons why I decided to, to write my new book because that's where I'm going into a very simple discussion about how do you solve this. And before I tell you more about that, let me just get back to my little model. I want to share one model with you in between with this, this one here because here's what's so fascinating. If you were to categorize your own life and what you're doing, well, then you actually can do it by creating a model looking like this. On the top, we have shoot. On the bottom, we have shouldn't. On the left, we have do. And on the right side, we have don't. Now, what's really fascinating about this model is that most startup companies, in fact, all belong to the very top side of this model. Uh, think about it. Uh, two crazy kids that get this uh, experience where they're smoking weeds in the dorm room and they're off their heads. 
and they take photos of each other, upload it on social media. And the day after, of course, hell breaks loose. And the kid is saying to his friend, I wish I could retract those photos. And guess what? That became the foundation of Snapchat. Snapchat today is a $50 billion company. It was based on the pain they experienced. It was based on common sense up there. So common sense and empathy. But as companies are growing bigger and bigger, what you will notice is it will go down to this space down there. People will feel more and more frustration. What is the opposite of common sense? It is nonsense. And that's really what I'm talking a lot about. That We actually have to be very aware of that in our world today, we actually increasingly as companies are becoming bigger and more complex, they actually increasingly also are suffering from nonsense. So let me just get back to this model for a second. So here's where I'm trying to fill in your day and my day. And I want to give you this little hint before we wrap up because we don't have a lot of time left. This is my way of removing nonsense from my life. As you remember, I said to you, we are wasting our lives every day by doing routines which are not making sense. So here's what I did. I started to map down my day-to-day life and I realized that suddenly at 10 o'clock every night, I would always waste time on YouTube. And it was crazy because I can't even remember what I was watching. So I started to work on a new model to reshuffle my life. You know, a little bit like when you have a computer and you're defragmenting the computer, you're putting the memory into different storage rooms. Well, why don't you do it with your own computer called your brain right now? Why don't you say, hey, let me rebuild my day-to-day life. And that's exactly what I decided to do. So if you take a look at this model here, you will notice that the model had in the bottom right, eliminate. That's all the crap you do every day which doesn't make sense. This is what I call nonsense. And then you have the area called path. That is the area where you do certain things. They may be right, they may be wrong. You're not really sure, you have to think about it. And then you have retain. Retain is things you do which are absolutely perfect. And then of course, last you have improve. That is things where you can be better. Now, this is the scary part. What I noticed was that 45% of my time was wasted down there in the nonsense area because I was adopting routines from before COVID-19. So my advice to you is, instead of you having a long to-do list, why don't you go the opposite way and create an on-to-do list, things you have to get rid of now because you probably, as we talked about, feel really exhausted. And let me just put up another questionnaire on the screen right now. So I'm going to ask the team just to put up a questionnaire for a second. And I would like you to answer this question. Which of the following scenarios do you recognize? One, I feel exhausted by the end of the day, having been attending one Zoom meeting after another, kind of feeling empty. Number one, you can also say number two, Honestly, after the end of the day, I just throw myself at the car at 8 p.m. and then it's time to work as if I haven't had a single minute to do it during the day. And number three is I feel perfect after my day. Those calls are easy for me to run and I feel fulfilled doing these. Now, you can answer several questions. So you can basically say one and two. That's fine. Um, but I'd like you to type it in now and then give me your feedback about where you are. And if you, like me, feel exhausted, then it may be it's relevant for you to think about working on that model we had here. Can I just ask you back in the studio, uh, what is the answer from everyone? Uh, We are still waiting for the answer from the people. But if I can answer for myself, sometimes I'm between the one and the three. When I feel sometimes exhausted, I feel sometimes zombie. So it depends very much on the day. And yeah. of course, in the evening, I'm trying to catch up with everything I didn't have time to do during the day. So it's, uh, you know, sometimes I ended up on Friday and I didn't realize when the week passed. So it's, uh, it's not that, uh, easy. Uh, zombie. You know what? It's very, it's very interesting what you're saying there, right? Now, let me just build on that for a second because here's a very good advice to all of you guys, including you. <clears throat> We do not transition our lives anymore. It's one big blend. The issue is that we have a pipeline of bureaucracy going straight into our bedrooms, and we need to change that. So there was actually a study conducted some time ago which showed that when scientists were dressing people up in a white lab coat, 
And above that white blood group, it said, doctor, people felt more intelligent and they were answering questions faster. And they actually felt a higher degree of self-esteem. When they took on a lab coat, which had no sign above it before they put it on, actually nothing changed. It's called enclosed cognition. And when we sit in front of the screen all the time, we never really transition from one mood to another. So my advice to you is to mentally imagine when you had a Zoom meeting that you open a door, you attend the meeting, and once you're done with it, you close the meeting mentally and you take notes and you put in a break of 15 minutes where you kind of defragment that meeting. So don't do back-to-back meetings. And by the way, if I was you, don't do back-to-back meetings the whole day. Only reserve half of the day to do it. So reshuffle your life because the reality we're feeling now probably is going to define how we're going to work in the future for a very long time. Now back to the studio. What did you learn? So most of the people replied number one. We have on our live comments number one and two. Someone is saying something nice like Zooms Zen Zombie. So we have also some playful words. So yeah, but the, the winner is number one. So everyone is feeling I'm not exhausted. sure I would call it a winner. I would call it a loser, right? Or I would but, call it a loser. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so these remember, are most of the people are feeling, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I feel so sorry for all of you guys. So here's three pieces of advice. First of all, fill out this form and create an inventory check of your daily life and reshuffle your life. Make sure when you've had all your meetings that you have your meetings in a separate room if you have space for that. Don't do your work in bed. Don't do it in the living room. Have it in a separate room. Close the door. When you leave the room, don't leave it straight away. You actually have to do me a favor, two favors. When you go to work, go out of your apartment or out of your house and around the building and then go into the meeting room. That transitions your brain. And second, once you're done with your meeting in the evening or whenever it is, don't go straight into the dinner table. Sit there and reflect on the whole day, do your notes, and then leave and close the door. This is a good way to avoid that you feel exhausted lying on the couch and now you have to do all your work. Believe me, I've been through it and it works. Now, I want to pause here because I know we're over time. So I want to hand it back to you. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for me. Thank you very much, Martin. These are very useful uh, tips that you are giving us. And actually, I'm going to take those because I don't do that. Sometimes I go straight to the dinner table and this is exactly a no-go. So I will take it as a good advice. Now, Martin, you know, it's been a terrible year from many points of view for all of us. Um, And it's um, we are during a pandemic and I wanted to ask you, what is the most important lesson regarding the team management that the business professionals should learn from this pandemic chapter, which completely changed our lives? I think the most important thing for me to say right now is the fact that uh, in marketing speak, we talk about a term which is called entry points. An entry point is something profound happening in our lives. Um, And what I tend to say is that we have seven entry points. One of them is, for example, expecting a newborn baby. Suddenly there's baby strollers everywhere. You see baby equipment everywhere. That is a good idea about how we have an entry point. Once you have a baby, your entire life changes. Well, for the first time in human history, we actually are experiencing an eighth entry point, a global synchronized behavioral change, which will have a profound change on everything else. So here's my advice to you. First of all, right now is the moment for you to realize one thing. If you go through a crisis like this and you haven't fundamentally changed your business, you didn't get the message. This is the moment to change your business. Number two, you need to understand what the consumer and the customers are thinking because they have fundamentally changed their view of life. I mean, a good example is a Melbourne-based company uh, in Australia was uh, during COVID-19 was created. And this company realized that when you're painting on the wall and you want to decorate your home while you are locked in, how do you buy paint? So they created a memory stick-like device which you can put on the wall and it will measure exactly the color which is on the wall, or on the curtains, or on the cushions. And then you beam this to your local paint store and they will deliver it back. And then you have exactly that color you're looking for and you didn't leave your home. Now, this company is the fastest growing company right now in Australia, and it's based on a very simple idea. It's called Tint Paint, and it's an idea of understanding consumer needs. That's the second advice. 
The third advice for you guys is that you need to understand that we probably will never go back to normal. So remember, we're going forward to work. And as we're going forward to work, you should onboard people differently. You should train people differently. You should hire people differently. Don't believe we're going back to normal because it will never happen again. What companies are realizing right now is that they saved a lot of money for doing this. And that means that those money are going straight to the bottom line. They're not being used for company culture. So what you have to do is to ensure that if you have a company, that you take some of the money back to the employees because what happens is that people will lose the motivation. Look at how many people are saying option one. We simply are just exhausted and people will leave. They'll burn out. Suicide rate among young people between the age of 15 and 28 uh, years of age in the United States has gone up so much that 70%, 70% of young people now have been considering committing suicide. I mean, this is a very, very serious issue. So if you don't work with your company culture and allocate the money to that rather than you know, putting them on the bottom line, you will notice that the entire foundation of your company will be, will be in danger, right? Thank you very much, Martin. Building actually upon on this uh, last uh, thing that you said, I wanted to ask you, uh, what, in your opinion, are the most disruptive changes that we will see in the corporate ecosystem in the following years after this episode? Because you just cha said that people are going to work differently. We will have to hire people differently, talk to them differently, interact with them differently. So what are the disruptive changes that you will see in the work ecosystem in the future? I think that we'll see a range of different issues. If I first of all look outside the working ecosystem, we will notice that the biggest change will happen among young people. Um, I mean, when you were young, do you remember uh, we, we were invincible? We would never die, right? Well, for the first time ever in history, young people have realized they are no longer invincible. And what it means is that what a person which is 50 or 60 or 70 years old are doing, it's actually what the young people are doing. It's almost like they jumped into a time capsule and actually were fast forwarding themselves 25 years. We now know that young people are starting to create to-do lists. They're starting to create a bucket list where they have all the things they want to do before they die. It's something I'm doing. I'm 50. But if you're 22 years of age, is that really what you would do? So they are changing behavior profoundly. If I go inside a company, there'll be a range of different things. First of all, what we will realize is that um, I don't think we will have uh, situations where business travel will happen to the same degree as it did before COVID-19. The reason why is very simple. Companies are now realizing that the money they saved um, it really was a benefit for them. So, so what happens is that if you save money on travel and you can replace it with Zoom and Teams meetings and productivity is going up, why should you have people jumping back on a plane? Now, here's the fact. Productivity is going up, yes. But how do you measure productivity? In my opinion, is measured based on the number of Zoom calls you have, Teams call you have, the size of your deck. But it's not measured on creativity, strategic thinking power. So, yes, we may be delivering more and more of these obsessive Zoom calls, but I don't think we actually contributed with what we really are good at, which is strategic thinking, creativity, alignment, all that stuff. So what you will see happening is, as a point number two, that we need to define or redefine what creativity is and how you are productive by uh, using a screen. And we also need to figure out how we redefine cultures. And most importantly, this is the moment for you to do an inventory check of your company and actually ask yourself, what are all the stupidities I have in my company right now? Why is all the nonsense? And find one stupid thing I've been doing at a time and slowly change it. And it's something I'm talking a lot about in my new book, The Ministry of Common Sense, because what I'm saying is, you never had a better time to redesign your company around it. For all this extensive... Right uh, do you hear me? Yes. I'm I now... Okay. Now. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for all these uh, tips and tricks. And uh, actually, I would like to invite our live watchers to ask live questions on our chat so we can address it to you because I'm pretty sure... 
even if you gave us a lot of tips, maybe they do have uh, other questions. And meanwhile, yeah, so, and, and I want to do, I want to do a, give a gift to everyone. So for the first two people asking a question right now, we'll give you a free book. Okay. The first right, two super. questions coming in, a free book to you. So let's see if there's any questions out there. So meanwhile, until the questions are coming, um, I would like to uh, take uh, the opportunity that I'm the host and ask you one more. Well, what would be the first three actions regarding organizational culture that each business owner, manager, entrepreneur should consider to thrive in this competitive environment that we are living in right now? I'll tell you a very simple story. So some years ago, one of the largest uh, respiratory disease product manufacturers came to me and asked me if they, how we got a closer relationship with the patients. And I said to them, let's spend time with the patients. So we went into homes of patients. Um, I had the executives joining me. And uh, we're sitting in this home of a 28-year-old lady. She'd had asthma her entire life. And I asked her, but tell me about the experience of having asthma when you're a child. And she started to cry. And I said to her, what, what's happening? Well, she said to me, it was horrible. You know, I was teased in school. I had no friends. I was never invited to parties. It really was horrible. So I said to her, well, listen, you look very happy today. What has changed? I said, I'll tell you. So she goes into her bag. She pulls out her handbag. And out of the handbag, she has a straw. And she said, this is my secret. I always give this straw to all people I meet and I ask them to hold them for the nose and breathe through the straw for one minute. And as I do that, they immediately feel how I feel as an asthma patient. And this is what I have suggested a lot of companies to do. One, one of the things I did with the pharma companies actually to install the whole senior management with a straw and have them breathe through the straw for a minute. And I remember I did it. And one executive, he spit out the straw. He said, this is ridiculous. If there was... So who will live this way? And I said, that's how your patients feel every minute of their entire life. So to come back to your question, the trick is very simple. The trick is to ensure that you exchange a sense of empathy. You bring your organization with you into homes of your customers or consumers or patients or passengers or whatever type of audience it is so they can feel the sense of empathy. And when you start to see the world from a different point of view, you also start to see the nonsense. Remember the opposite of common sense. So that's the first thing I'll do. The second thing I'll do is to find frictions internally, things where you really, really, really fostered about things and take one little thing and say, let's address that in 90 days. And once you do that, what you will realize is that you actually slowly are changing or removing one stupidity at a time. And by the way, this title of the book is not a coincidence. In fact, we started up a ministry of common sense, a real one in London for the first time at Standard Charter Bank. And then later on, we actually did it across the world in multiple companies. So this is not just a cute idea. It actually exists. Thank you, Martin. Uh, actually, we started to have questions. So the first one that wins also one of your books is from Teodora Ionescu, and I will read it. Is cultural transformation doable for any kind of company, including the big ones with hundreds, even thousands of employees? What are the usually challenges when it comes to enterprise-level businesses? It's a very, very good question. And I think the best way for me to illustrate that is to tell you a story. So, some years ago, uh, chickens were put into a cage. They're stuck into the cage for half a year. And one day they're let out on the beautiful green grass and the sun was shining and the birds were singing and the chickens went out. And guess what happened? After 30 seconds, they went straight back in again. And I call that the chicken cage syndrome. And really what it is, it's the fear of the unknown. Uh, this is the biggest hurdle you have when you have a big enterprise business that people are afraid. They're afraid of telling the opinion. They're afraid of doing things. So let me just tell that in a different way. I want to just imagine that you are seeing chicken cages from the very top. And this is a square of four chicken cages. And I'll be very nice to the chickens. I'm opening the gates so they can get out in the beautiful green grass. And here's the issue. When companies want to change their culture, they always put and goal, which is very far and very different to reach. And the first thing the chicken will think is, my God, this is far away. 
my KPIs are not aligned around it. And by the way, what if that manager is being fired and I stand out there in the middle? It, it's completely embarrassing. So what happens is that when you set goals that far away, it simply won't work. So what we learned is to place the corn straight outside the cage. I call that a 90-day intervention. It's a small bite-sized change. And what I would recommend you to do in, in your company is really to do exactly that. It is to find one little friction. It may be people feel they have um, too many emails, let's say, right? Now, if I take a look at the banking industry, when I interviewed people in the banking industry, they actually said to me they, in average, are receiving 800 emails a day, which is crazy. Think about it. 800 emails a day is the same as 13 hours of work just looking at emails if you're spending one minute per email. So I said to these guys, hey, why don't we get rid of the CC button? And why don't we get rid of the reply all button? And I said, well, that's right. So we did it for 90 days. People could simply not CC or copy each other in. And after 90 days, the number of emails were reduced from 800 to 362 emails on average. And we didn't have a single complaint. This is a simple way of removing a friction and then turning it into an opportunity. And that's my point. One step at a time, 90-day interventions, celebrate the success, and then take another piece of corn and put it further and further away so you transform the organization. Thank you, Martin. And uh, the second winner and also the second question is from Alina Sampetru. Actually, she has two questions, so she really deserves a book. Uh, first <laughs> yeah. of all is, um, who, how do you decide what's stupid? And then building up on that, she says that empathy is about understanding a feeling or an experience, but also about being able to express that to the other person. I'm writing a book on how to manage the tribulation of talking about complicated things in a simple way. Where do you think this rather common sense topic would be most welcome in today's world in B2B, politics or education? Well, the first answer to your question, which is, and um, no, what, 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 <laughs> what situation are we in right now? I think that you have to, if you had to evaluate what is common sense or not, you have to ask the consumer. You have to look at the world from outside in. You can't look at it from inside out. So just like my remote control, I think that you need to be in constant contact with the consumer and the customer all the time. They decide what's common sense or not. You don't do it inside the organization. And, and I would say on, on, on the second question, yes, I think we are getting to a stage where it's actually needed at all levels. Of course, I don't need to tell you in politics, it's very important, but it's also most important, I think, in school levels. I would start to create classes which are teaching empathy. In fact, in Denmark, they already now have empathy classes for the very young kids in school because we're losing that skill set right now. So if I was you, I would build up a training program for students in and, and kids in school. Um, now, parents, I think, would appreciate it. Kids will not appreciate it. They won't think about it. They'll only think about it 15 years later where they'll realize that we actually have a generation which is much more happy. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so, uh, Teodora and Alina, we will get back to you to give you the books from Martin and we will take another question from the audience. How would Martin reconcile the effectiveness of the B2B sales with reducing travel costs? I think uh, the, the, the issue in the end of the day with cost savings today comes down to the fact that we are spending more and more time in a meeting room talking with each other and that's how we measure productivity but what if we measured productivity based on how customer feels about interacting with us how happy customers are and the type of happiness internally in the organization how good we are at working together. I think these factors have to be much more prominent. In fact, a good friend of mine, the former CEO of Boeing and of Ford, Alan Molly, have a very simple way of measuring uh, how he would uh, give people bonuses inside the company. He basically said, I want to measure you on how well you've done your work. 
but I also want to measure you on how well the company has performed. And then I want to add those two numbers together. So if you get a score of maximum two on the first one and maximum two on the second one, you can get a maximum combined score of four, right? But then he says, let's multiply that with a third number. And the third number is, how good are you at working with other other people within your organization? And this is really important because we have a tendency to work in silos and silos don't work really together. But if I want to create an amazing customer experience, then you need to work together. I mean, it doesn't work if you're an airline company and you first had to book your suitcase and then you had to book your catering food and then I had to book my entertainment and then I had to book my flights. It all has to work together seamlessly. And as the net is making this more and more prominent, we have to break down silos internally. So what Alan Marley did was he said, I'll give you a score of up to two if you're really good at working with other people. Now, here's the issue. That was two. You can also get a score of one, and even worse, you can get a score of zero. Now, four times zero equals zero equals no bonus. Four times one, if you're okay at working with other people, it's good. But if four times two equals eight, you're getting a pretty high bonus because you're good at working with other people. And that in its own right is removing nonsense within the organization because some of the organization or departments are starting to work together. So it's a very powerful way of looking at it. Now I will take another question, which is very interesting. Can you give us an example of a tool that is helping leaders to build teams and organizations where common sense is the rule rather than the exception? I think the most important tool I have is actually a tool which I uh, will give to all of you guys free of charge. Um, and it's a tool where you can measure how good your organization is in order to measure um, the degree of empathy or sympathy you have within your organization. And I just want to share that with you uh, in a second because the tool, what's so powerful about the tool is that, uh, and you won't be able to see a lot on the screen right now, so I won't share with you, but you actually have different questions you're asking, and then you will very quickly determine the degree of corporate behavior you have or how good you are getting rid of nonsense in your organization. Now, here's what I'm going to do. For all of you guys who signed up to this session here, I'm going to ensure that you'll get an email from uh, Brand Minds, and uh, Brand Minds will send you a one pager where you can test how good you are at having empathy within your organization. And once you go through this test, it only takes three minutes, super quick. You will actually know how many minutes per day you are wasting on, on lack of common sense. And you'll also discover the reason why. So that's a gift from me to you. Thank you for the question. And um, you no know, Brand Minds will send it to you very soon after this session today. Thank you, Martin. Now, uh, we can take one more question because uh, our time is getting to the end. What is the most encountered corporate practice that bogged down the workplace in bureaucracy? And I've seen actually a lot of examples in your book, but maybe you can pick one or two. <laughs> or two. Okay. I, I think number one is the meeting culture we have right now. Uh, I think that is a, is a horrible behavior, which is getting worse and worse. Um, so I definitely would put it up there. And I think the second thing is our email obsession. Uh, I think those two factors um, are just destroying us. I think a lot of people feel today frustrated. They feel they don't have the time. They don't have the energy to answer all these emails. I mean, if I was to ask everyone watching right now, how many percent of your emails are you actually reading? I think... Either you would say, I read all of them, but quite often I'm extraordinarily late on it. Or many of you probably will say perhaps half. Now, I spoke with the editor of a very well-known magazine the other day in New York City. She had 2,500 unopened emails in her inbox. I mean, that is what's paralyzing us. Of course, rules and regulations and compliance is also a major factor. We create rules for the sake of rules. And I want to tell you one story, which I'm also writing about in the new book, The Ministry of Common Sense, and that um, I was going into this bank and I had to understand where was things going wrong. So I went to the 18th floor. I was meeting up with the head of compliance and I said to her just for fun, so how many rules have you created? 
And they looked at me and she said, 1,242 rules. She was not kidding. So she took this huge manual, and slapped it in my lap, and I was flicking through all these rules, right? And at page 200 and something, I stopped while she was talking. And I said, here's a rule. And the rule is, when you start a contract, always ensure that you email it, post it, and send it by fax. I said to her, do you have a fax machine? She said, no, I don't have a fax machine. I said, have you ever considered killing some of your own rules? And she said to me, no, why should I? Why should I destroy my own work? And this is the essence of how we become. We're more focused on seeing the world from inside out rather than outside in. And with that, I want to quote Benjamin Franklin, which once said, common sense is something that everyone needs. Few have and none think they lack. And this is the reason why I wrote the Ministry of Common Sense. Martin, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us tonight. And thank you for all these valuable insights you gave us. Uh, I hope we will meet each other soon in real life, face-to-face -face event, actually, because we, I that think we fun. all that miss that. <laughs> yeah, I hope that to see you fun. soon Can again in Can I just ask Bucharest. you a question? Yes, you, you, read, you read the book. What do you think about the book? Well, um, as I told you, when we discussed before our live meeting, for me, uh, it was a lot of fun to read it. I told you, I laugh a lot for, for a lot of examples that you gave. Then uh, it got me a little bit sad because, you know, I work in a, in a huge corporation. And actually, it's true. We do have sometimes a lot of rules that are against the evolution, against innovation. Uh, it, it, you know, sometimes stop us to move forward in the pace that we would like to take. But if you ask me, I will take this because I think it's very interesting. And I even post it on Instagram because I think it incorporates very much what you wrote here. When people start working inside organizations, something happens to them. They forget they are human. And this is the moment when I got sad. They start adhering to rules, processes, procedures, and official and unofficial codes of behavior that makes no sense to anyone outside the organization. And this is the moment when I started to laugh. But then I realized that I think it's very much up to us to change this. And I think you gave us a lot of insights and your expertise and all the examples you gave us in this book. It can help us a lot. Taking small steps, I think we will be able to, you know, big, bring common sense back and eliminate all these rules that are stopping us to move forward. So back home to everyone, I would like to remind you that you can order Martin's book on Carturesti.ro website. It is translated in Romanian. I read it in English and it was really delightful. And uh, don't forget about the next Brand Minds events. Uh, using the code STRATEGY10, you can take a 10% discount for the next masterclass with Costas Marquides that will take place on the 23rd of March. Thank you again, Martin. Stay safe. Take care of yourself. Keep writing books and hope to see each other soon. Thank you very Thank much, you. World Changers. See you on March 23rd. Thank you. In 2021, level up your company's business strategy. Brand Minds presents Business Strategy Masterclass for top executives. Learn the principles of innovative companies from Costas Marquitas, one of the world's most renowned business experts and executive education director from London Business School. 23rd of March, 2021, exclusively online. This masterclass is for top executives, investors, business owners, sales experts, creative specialists, marketing managers, brand managers, CEOs, HR managers, and strategy specialists. This masterclass is for you. Join today at brandminds.live.